This is Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast where we bring Jesus into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, Jason Romano here. This is Sports Spectrum. So glad you're tuning into our program today. My email address, jason at sportspectrum.com, jason at sportspectrum.com. If you have a guest idea for this show or a story that you'd like to share or any encouragement or anything you want to talk about with regards to the Sports Spectrum podcast, you can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. And we are presented today by Ronald Blue Trust. Their advisors applying biblical wisdom and technical expertise to help clients make wise financial decisions experiencing clarity and confidence and leave a lasting legacy. Check them out over at ronblue.com, ronblue.com. I'm really excited today about our guest, DJ Shockley, the former Georgia Bulldogs quarterback, played in Georgia from 2001 to 2005, grew up in the state of Georgia, plays college football in Georgia, and then is selected in the seventh round of the 2006 NFL Draft in Georgia by the Atlanta Falcons. He played five seasons with Atlanta from 2006 to 2010. During his college career, it saw him in 2005 being named first team all SEC. He was also the SEC championship game MVP in 2005 and a two-time SEC champion, DJ Shockley. This is a lot of fun as we talk about faith, we talk about football and him growing up He was the man. He was the number two ranked quarterback in the country coming out of high school. And then Mark Richt secured DJ Shockley and convinced him and nudged him to choose the University of Georgia. DJ's got a great story in how he came to the Bulldogs. And then we talk about faith and his journey to faith. He did not grow up, I would say, in a faith-based environment that focused on relationship with Jesus. He did go to church. But he shares the story of what happened in college to him and brought him closer to the Lord. And then the adjustment into the NFL, adjusting to being out of the NFL. And what was that like for him, who all he knew for most of his life was playing the game of football? This is a fun conversation with a great guy, DJ Shockley, joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. DJ, welcome to Sports Spectrum, buddy. Good to see you. Jason, man. Appreciate you having me on. And uh, I was honored you asked me to come on, man. So I appreciate the opportunity to come on and uh, chat with you for a little bit. Absolutely. Now, you're doing this podcast thing too, right? You just started your podcast. Yeah, yeah I just started. Um, I'm probably about three episodes in right now. Uh, it's called the Triple Threat Podcast. And um, started out with my man, Maurice Claret, which which I think a lot of people know his story, but he was pretty open and honest. So we we had we talked to him the first couple of weeks. And then I had my man Frenchie on last week, Jeff Francoeur, uh, which was pretty cool. I hadn't talked to him in a while. Yeah. And then um, and then got uh, Jesse Tuggle uh, on now. So uh, we, we got a couple of good guys that have been on and, you know, I, it's pretty cool, you know. It's it's kind of out my comfort zone a little bit. I've never really done like my own podcast. I've always been the guy that you know I've had to ask questions to, or you know, been asked a question. So it's mm-hmm. a little different, but uh, hey, sometimes you got to step outside that box and do do something new, and that's what I'm trying to do. Listen, three years ago, that's what I did with this show, and it was hard, <laughs> and I was scared, but we pushed through, and thankfully, we got people to come on and talk about it like yourself, but like you did for your show, you got Maurice Claret and Jeff Francoeur and others, Jesse Tuggle to come on and that helps having the right guests. So why don't you share real quick as we go into your journey here real quick, just for people to know about the podcast, it's called the triple threat. Why that title? I think I know the answer, but I'll let you. Well, you know, you you know, what's pretty funny about it is my wife actually came up with it because initially I wanted it to be the dual threat podcast because hey I was a dual threat quarterback uh you know now uh I'm doing some some tv stuff so it's like I could do multiple things my wife was sitting there yeah. and she was like what about if you call it triple threat and I was like why do you say that and she was like well you went from an athlete to an analyst you're a dad you're a uh you're a husband and now you enjoy you know speaking you, you know your faith is a big part of it so she's like that's like triple threat and I was like you know what 
That is pretty cool. I like that. So my wife has all, I give her all the credit for it. It has nothing to do with me. She came up with it. Uh, I thought it was a pretty cool idea. And uh, we've kind of kind of taken off and that's where it went. So that's where Triple Threads come from. I love it. People should go listen to it. It's available everywhere podcasts are found and it's out now. Let's go back a little bit as we kind of get into your journey, DJ, about that DJ Shockley kid that grew up in Georgia. So take us back. What was life like for you as a kid growing up? Take us a little bit through your journey. So what's funny is now I'm in the the world of I'm kind of a handyman now. Um, I got two neighbors who are helping me rebuild my deck right now. Nice. And I say that, and I say that because when I was younger, my days were spent on some kind of field, some kind of court, day and night. That's all I did. Uh, my my parents, you know, uh, grew up in a, a household where education was number one for sure, but sports was a big part of my life. So I didn't have much time to be a handyman or learn these different trades and all this kind of stuff. And to push forward now, that's kind of what I'm doing. That's what I'm into, and you know. Uh, I got all kind of tools and stuff, so it, it's pretty fun to do. But uh, growing up, it was sports, it was school, it was uh, being a guy uh, that everybody wanted to uh, kind of emulate because of the way you brought up. And my parents were a big part of that, taught me a lot of things growing up. Um, two younger brothers and a younger sister. So I was always the older brother that had to make sure everybody was in line. And from day one, my dad always was trying to instill in me the importance of being a great man, being a, a great kid, being a good person of character. And that's kind of where it started as a young age. And I remember when I was six years old, I went out to play. First time I went out to play football, and they put me at running back. So I was at running back for maybe half the practice. Then the second half of the practice, they said, let's try your quarterback. And I go, and they said, okay. You got to take a snap. And I'm like, okay. But they said, you got to put your hand on his butt. And I looked at the coach and said, nah, I'm not doing that. I'm not. And then, so I guess quickly I got over that uh, little, little fear or whatever. And yeah. uh, turned out to be uh, pretty good. And uh, But I, I say from a little kid to where I'm at now, my parents were the ones always trying to instill in me uh, goals, uh, making sure that you – uh, aspired to do great things. And I remember when I was in high school, uh, for a lot of people who don't know, my dad was my high school coach. And in high school, in ninth grade, he told me, I don't want you just to be the best quarterback on our team. I don't want you to be the best quarterback in our county. I don't even want you to be the best quarterback in our state. He said, I want you to be the best quarterback in the entire country. And wow. as a ninth grader, I was like, Dad, you're talking crazy. That's unreal. You know how many quarterbacks there are in the country. I've been to these camps. I know what these guys look like. But mentally, he was kind of preparing me to set goals, uh, to reach for the sky, have no limits on what you feel your potential can be. And to this day, I remember that story and leaving high school being the number two rated quarterback in the country, which actually worked out well, was all right. It did work out. Now, let me ask you about – all right, so why don't we just do this? Rank these things for you as – that freshman or that sophomore in high school, okay? Sports, friends, uh -huh. family, faith. Where would you say for 14 to 15-year-old DJ Shockley, where – it's really what I'm trying to get to is where your faith was, and I'm not saying it wasn't yeah. important, but just being honest because oh, yeah. a lot of us struggle with that. Rank sports or even just football, friends, family, and faith. I think, number one, as a 15-year-old kid, yeah. It had to be sports first, then it was my family, then it was my friends, and then faith was probably last. I mean, I grew up in a Catholic church, uh, always went to church on Sundays, you know, took communion, you know, got baptized, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I grew up in a Catholic church, and it was cool. Um, I understood what was going on, but it wasn't my focal point, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a, always a guy of faith, always, you know, believed in God, but at the end of the day, uh, as a 14, 15-year-old kid, I was definitely more worried about sports and my friends more than I was, for sure, being a, a guy of faith. So take me through that success you talked about. You ended up being the number two ranked quarterback in the country, and I think it was Super Preps actually had you as number one, right? Number one overall in the country? Yeah. And so there's a lot of success happening there, and you go through this recruiting process. 
And I can't imagine what that's like just having everybody in the country coming at you and saying, hey, we want you to come play with us. And I've heard horror stories about recruiting. I've heard great stories about recruiting. <laughs> and somewhere along the lines, Mark Richt, you know, comes along and has that impact and you say yes to Georgia. So take us through the recruiting process and what that was like. So I got a, I got a couple of good recruit stories for sure. Um, obviously, recruiting is not what it is now. Uh, the era that we live in now is beyond crazy. And the way these kids go about where they're going to go to school is an entire production. I had none of that. Uh, but I was recruited pretty heavily, recruited by everybody in the country except Steve Spurrier. Mm. And I remember that to this day. And whenever I see Coach Spurrier, uh, I actually remind about it. He laugh about it. And he has a, a pretty cool story. I'll tell you a little bit. But the recruiting part of it was was pretty fun. I uh, obviously was a Georgia kid, homegrown kid. But um, Coach Rick at the time was at Florida State. And to be honest, I wanted to play for Coach Rick. I said, this guy's Coach Chris Winkie. He's Coach Charlie Ward, two Heisman Trophy winners on the complete opposite side of the spectrum as far as athleticism and all that kind of stuff. So I said, this guy can coach one guy who has this skill set and another guy with this skill set. That's the coach I want to play for. So he was at Florida State, and he comes, and I go to their team gala. I'm sitting at the table with him, and he says, you know what, Shock? I think Florida State is the best place for you. You can come here. You can excel. I think you will do great things here. Two weeks later, he takes the Georgia job. The, next, the same day he takes the Georgia job, he is sitting in my living room, and he says, you know what, Shock? I think Georgia is the best place for you. I think you could come here and excel and do great things. I was like, Coach, you just said that about Florida State. He was like, Shock, you know what I mean. I'm the best coach for you. So uh, that was a good uh, – every time I talk to Coach Rick, that's a funny story that uh, we both laugh about. Um, but the recruiting trail was fun, man. Um, obviously, being recruited by everybody. Um, at the time, bro, me and Brody Kroll was the, you know, one and two going back and forth. Uh, I remember Brody Kroll, Derek. Uh, Anderson was a part of our class. Adrian McPherson, all of us were a part of the Super 11, which was pretty fun when it, it first started. I think we might have been like the second class for it. Yeah. And so I would go to all these different camps. And I remember as a 10th grader, I went to a Florida State camp and my dad put me with the juniors and seniors. And usually they would split the 9th and 10th graders and then you'd be the 11th and 12th graders. So he put me with the 11th and 12th graders and – I didn't think none of it. I was just out there throwing and, you know, ripping it and, you know, trying to, you know, impress the coaches. And that's how Coach Rick actually saw me because he thought I was an older kid, you know, playing with 11th, 12th grade. And he was like, you're only in 10th grade or 9th grade, whatever it was. And that's when the recruitment started with Coach Rick. But being recruited by everybody in the country was pretty cool. I remember, uh, like every other kid, keeping all your recruiting letters everywhere. And I had got to the point where, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was uh, people were telling me stuff, but I was like, I'm only going to open the ones that are handwritten. I'm not going to open the ones that are generic. I'm not going to open the ones that they type up and send everybody. Uh, so my mom still has a bunch of those letters at the house, which is pretty cool. So that recruiting process was fun. And obviously being where I was at that time, uh, the number two rated quarterback in the country, uh, I thought was pretty cool and being recruited by everybody in the country and, uh, they pull out the red carpet there where you go was definitely fun. But I only went on three recruiting trips because I was exhausted through them. I never took my whole five. I went to North Carolina, Florida State, and Georgia. Mm -hmm. So those were the, the three schools I think were at the top of my list uh, during that time. So I could have easily been a, an ACC guy uh, sitting here today. DJ Shockley is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Take me through – coach Richt and the impact that he had on you. I mean, it's one thing to say I'm the coach for you and he convinces you to choose Georgia, but then there's an impact that I know. And I talked to coach Richt a few times, had him on this, on this show and met him when I was at ESPN. And I was just taken back by how gentle of a giant he was like he commanded respect, but he was just a soft spoken, gentle giant of a leader. He reminded me a lot of Tony Dungy and some of the times and encounters that I had with coach Dungy. So what was it about coach Rick that nudged you towards not only choosing Georgia, but then the impact that he had on your journey there? Well, I think the number one thing that 
I get asked about Coach Rick is, is he the guy that you see on TV? And without hesitation, I say absolutely. And I think that's what draws so many players to Coach Rick. And I think that's why he had so much success while he was at Georgia was because of the type of person he was. For one, you knew he cared about you as a man. He wanted you to graduate. And he wanted you to know who God was. And that's the three things that I tell people all the time is all that kind of stuff, football, all that kind of stuff was on the back burner. Yeah, he wanted to be a great player. Yeah, of course, he wanted to win games. But at the end of the day, he cared about the soul of each player that he brought to the University of Georgia because at the end of the day, he had to sit in, he had to sit in those parents and those kids' houses and tell them, hey, I'm going to take your kid away for four or five years and I'm going to be the guy that's going to be protected. And he was a guy that lived up to his word. And I remember uh, going into my sophomore year, I was thinking about leaving Georgia. And uh, this was the truest test that I could say of who Coach Rick was, was he knew I was going to transfer. He knew that uh, he knew that I wanted to play. He knew I wanted to have uh, the opportunity to play at a high level. And I went into his – I went into his office. He said, Shock, I know you're thinking about leaving, but let me say something first. And he said, the one thing I know is you're going to leave here with an education. You're going to leave here with a smile on your face and just know that I love you. And he said, I can't guarantee that you stay. I'm going to play you X amount of games. I'm not going to start you this amount of games because I was his official rec- first recruit to Georgia. So yeah. as we know, to this day, as well as back then, no coach wants to lose any recruit, let alone their first recruit to that particular school. So for me, in my mind, I said, this guy could have told me anything in the world. He could have lied to me about saying, hey, we're going to start you three games out this year. We're going to play you 50% of the snaps. We're going to split you and David Green, whatever it may be. He didn't tell me any of that. He told me the straight truth. And for me, I respected that more than anything because I could have went anywhere else and who knows what could have happened. I don't know that scenario. I don't know the coach as well. But I knew one thing that I was going to be a Georgia kid. So that means I was going to get my education. And that would be huge for a guy living in the state of Georgia. And then also I knew exactly where this man who, who is, you know, the end all be all at that university as far as coaching um, college football. Yeah. And this guy was speaking the truth to me. And I said, why would I not want to play for a guy who I know has my best interest at heart, but also wants me to succeed and will always tell me the truth. And that went a long way for me. And that was one of the biggest reasons why I stayed at the University of Georgia was because of that conversation I had with him that day. We'll get back to our conversation with DJ Shockley in just a second, but I want to tell you some more about Ronald Blue Trust, the company's certified financial planning professionals offering comprehensive financial planning and investment management services based on biblical principles to individuals and families across the U.S. who are beyond the debt problem stage but want to be good stewards of their wealth. They got over 35 years of experience. And if you have any questions right now about your financial future, about how to steward your wealth properly, Ronald Blue Trust is a great place to go to. And I love that they have the word trust in their name because we trust them. We do. And we love having them as partners with us here at Sports Spectrum. Check them out at ronblue.com for all your financial questions and concerns. ronblue.com. Let's get back to DJ Shockley joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. But I want to go into your faith a little bit and where that faith deepened where that faith became your own, where that faith became a priority and it wasn't fourth or even last on the pecking order like you were telling me when you were 15, but how that now is a priority for you. Can you take us to the moment where you started that relationship and started to take God a little more seriously and he became more real to you? I'll be honest. It started um, probably my second or third year in college. I had gone through a couple of things. I was hurt. Um, I had to overcome a couple obstacles and I started to seek them a little bit more. And then as I got into my senior year, our team chaplain comes to me, Kevin Hines, and he says, dude, you have such a huge draw with your teammates. You have no idea how much these guys will follow you. And I didn't think about it. You know, I was, you know, I'm a quarterback. So, you know, you think, you know, guys should, you know, follow you or whatever it may be. Sure. But he pulls me in his office. And he says, I want you to read this scripture. 
And when you read the scripture, this is all we're going to do today. Read the scripture, and I want you to come back. I want you to tell me what it means. And I remember to this day, John 3.30, which basically says, he must increase, I must decrease. That's I it. read it, and I came back, and I said, I read it, but I'm still on the fence about it. He said, okay, go back home, dive in a little bit more. And when I, when I came back, I knew exactly what it meant. And at the time, as a senior, there were so many people who were saying, you couldn't do it. There were so many people saying, okay, now it's your turn. Now you got to do everything. You got to lead everybody. And at that moment, I knew he was saying, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to put everything on your shoulders because we, we have a God that, that will, will go above and beyond for us and will make sure that no situation is too big for us. And at that moment, it freed me up. Mm. And from that day, I started leading Bible studies throughout that whole year. Um, we started with about four or five guys. By the time we got to the end of the year, my whole entire apartment was full of guys. So we, we had our own little FCA in my apartment throughout the year, which was, which was awesome. And I think ultimately that will led our team and helped us because we had a bunch of guys like myself who were back up for the last three, four years. And now we had an opportunity and now we have become so close because of one, our faith, but also because we believe in each other wholeheartedly because we had all pretty much gave our heart to each other while we're in these Bible studies, in these FCAs. And that goes back to that senior year where he gave me that one small scripture and it led to me being free. My, my whole entire just body was and soul was like, you don't got to do it all by yourself, man. That's awesome. But, I love that. Is there fear there, though, for you to lead a Bible study? I'm thinking me when I was 22. And I guess <laughs> as a quarterback, I probably would have thought, yeah, I can lead the team and, and do the things I have to do as a quarterback. But leading a Bible study can be pretty intimidating at a young age. But you yeah. just went into it, huh? Just jump right in, man. I, I think during that time, it was a point where I knew that I could do more. I felt there was so much more for me to give other than just being the quarterback of this team. And of course I continued to meet with our chaplain and he would give me, you know, ways to navigate the whole entire Bible study and questions to ask and how to, you know, uh, be a light for everybody. So uh, as we kind of went through the whole process, we all kind of grew together. So it wasn't just, Hey, I'm gonna run this entire thing. We kind of delegated, Hey, this week you share this. This week you share that, and and it just kind of blossomed. So it, it wasn't one of those things where again I didn't have to do it all by myself. You know, it was one of those things I could actually help lead guys, and then everybody else could pick up the slack and like we did on the field. So you come out of Georgia and you end up in the NFL, and you're drafted in the seventh round by the Falcons. So it's your hometown team but it's the seventh round. So what was the sort of emotions that you were going through when you saw Atlanta was going to take you, but it did take a little while until you were selected. What, what was sort of the emotions that you were going through and processing during that time? Jason, I cried during the draft process, man. The whole thing. Seriously. <laughs> oh man. No. Well, it was like, I knew I was told I probably would be a mid round guy, fourth, fifth round, maybe, yeah. but never thought seventh round. So when the fourth, fifth round goes by, I literally leave. I go upstairs and I am just distraught. I'm wow. watching guys who I think, like, I'm like, man, I'm better than that dude. Like, how am I not getting drafted? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I am hurt. And the funny part about it is, seventh round comes around and the Falcons call me. But I think it's somebody who's just in Atlanta because it's an Atlanta number. I'm from Atlanta. Yeah. I sent them the voicemail. I didn't even answer the phone. They called back again. I was like, the same number is calling twice. Maybe I should pick it up. Pick it up. It's Jim Mora. And I'm like, I'm elated. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a hometown guy. And the crazy thing is, when you go through the draft process, they tell you, well, this team is paying a lot of attention to you. They're not going to draft you. I did four or five different interviews with the Falcons. I worked out for them a couple times. I was like, there's no way the Falcons are going to draft me. And uh, when it came around, they drafted me. I was pretty excited. Um, the first person I meet when I walk into the facility, I see is Michael Vick. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I've been watching this dude for the last, you know, I don't know how many years. This guy's the face of the NFL. Now I'm going to share a quarterback room with him. Then I walk in the facility and I literally 
I don't even think I said anything. I, I just looked at him, and he was like, Shock, what's up, man? How you doing? And he, he was real nice and cool about it. So I was like, man, it was pretty cool moment to, you know, meet him for the first time and then be drafted to the Falcons in the seventh round, which which was probably a, a dream come true. Um, but as we know, the seventh round is pretty much like being a free agent a lot of the time. So it was an uphill battle for sure just to make the team that year uh, because they had Brian Roundell, who was from Virginia Tech, who had been there a year or two and uh, kind of had a foothold in there. Uh, so, uh, you know, two Virginia Tech boys, you know, and as I was like, oh, man, I got an uphill battle already. But uh, ended up making a team, man. It was, it was pretty cool. And I'll never forget. And what's so crazy is Arthur Blank told me this. Uh, years after I actually, you know, I seen him like three, four years after I left the Falcons. And he still says he remembers the day when I went in for my first preseason game and people stayed around in a preseason game for me to play. And he said he remembers it like it was yesterday. When I came running onto the field, all he heard was like people bark. And he said it to his day, you still had all those Georgia people in the fans stands waiting on you. And uh, I thought it was uh, – I thought it was pretty cool. That is pretty awesome. Um, take me through the process of, you know, your NFL career was, I believe, five seasons. You were with Atlanta. Um, and then just a short while later, you're out of the league and your career is done. Your football career, the transition, you're not even 30 years old yet and there's no more football to play. What was yeah. that like for you transitioning away? Because I hear so many stories from guys who uh, really struggled with the transition because – it's all they've known since they were little kids. So what was that like for you? The transition was, I think, tough, but it also was something I kind of prepared myself for, knowing that I um, wanted to get into the broadcast where after I left, um, because while I was with the Falcons, I was doing certain things in the broadcast world. And I never thought I would be in broadcasting, to tell you the truth. I got my degree in speech communications, and the reason I got it was because – when I got to college, I would always watch guys do interviews. And I'm like, this guy keeps saying, um, but he, he, you don't understand what he's saying. I was like, I don't want to be that guy. I was like, I could talk, but I want to make sure if I want to be the quarterback at this major university that I can speak intelligently at any situation, you know, big or small. Yes. And that's kind of why I got into speech communication. And it ultimately, when I got to the Falcons my rookie year, they asked me that I want to do my own kind of little show, kind of off the field interviewing guys. And that's where it kind of started. And once I kind of finished playing, I was into that field already doing stuff, you know, into it. So the transition was good. And I say it was kind of tough because as most guys do, when they get forced out, they probably still feel like they can play. And I still felt like I had plenty of years left to play, but yeah. it just, it wasn't for me to be. So, uh, uh, you know, it was tough, but also I, I had prepared myself for hopefully an opportunity to get into what I'm doing now. The toughest part of the transition to broadcasting, what was that for you? Who the toughest part is making sure that what you say actually matches the truth. And what I mean by that is there are so many people who know their team in and out and you can't be it's your way around it. And right. yeah. a lot of guys, you know, they may have played the game and they feel like they can just be it's their way around it, but you have to know your stuff. And when that light comes on, you have a certain amount of time to get your point across and you got to get it across in a way that everybody can understand. And that was the toughest part for me was trying to simplify everything because for so long I talked in a whole nother language that other people knew about. But now I had to go into this part of the world where you had to kind of explain it as if this was the person's first time ever watching this particular sport. And for me, simplifying it, I think it was the toughest part. But once I got past that, it was, you know, actually pretty easy talking. And I actually enjoy it because it, it gives me the same principles as when I played. You got to study. You got to put the time in. You got to be knowledgeable. You got to make sure that everything you say matches what you do. I mean, so uh, that's been kind of the, the goal is you kind of keep the same routine when you play. And I'll be honest, when 
the red light comes on on TV, I get the same nervous energy I had when I was about to play. So that lets me know that I'm intrigued, I'm into it, and I have to be on my best because if not, just like ball, they'll replace you. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, that is true. <laughs> yeah. DJ Shockley, this has been great, brother. As we wind down, last question I want to ask you is a question we ask all of our guests here on the show. Where God's brought you to today, where you are today, we were talking about your, your kids before we started recording and all God's brought you through with the new podcast and broadcasting. And this has been a weird, weird, a weird year for us all, obviously, in 2020. What's the great lesson the, the Lord has shown you during the season of life you're in? What's he teaching you? Uh, what's he showing you right now? I think the number one thing is patience. And my wife says it all the time. You have the patience of a guy that is unreal. And I think because of all the things I've had to go through, all the obstacles I had to overcome, being a guy who for most of his life, all the way up to college was the guy. And then getting to college and getting hurt, not starting, not playing. And I had to be patient. And I get into the broadcast world and it's slow. And it's guys are moving ahead of you. It's, you know, a lot of things you felt like you should be in this particular spot but at the end of the day God has he's blessed me with patience to understand where I'm at and understand he's got me in a place where I'm at for a reason and he's not going to push me too fast he's not going to make sure I stay behind he's going to make sure I'm right where I'm supposed to be and as long as I continue to to stay diligent and stay in his word and make sure that hey he's a sinner everything will go according to plan so I think patience is the number one thing. You talk about what's going on in this world. I mean, we all have to be patient. Everything is changing day by day. And if you're moving too fast or you're trying to do too much, bad things are going to happen. So you got to be patient where you're at and, and make sure that you're living for God and living for, for, for the right things. He is DJ Shockley, the former Georgia quarterback, ESPN SEC Network college football analyst. Got the new podcast, Triple Threat. It's out now. Go listen. Go subscribe. It's good stuff there. Thanks, man. This has been great. Thanks for uh, doing this, and let's get you back on, and we'll, we'll talk some more football. We'll talk some more faith. I appreciate you. Jason, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me, and uh, we've known each other for a while now, so I appreciate you know uh, your heart, and I appreciate you wanting me to be on, and uh, congrats on all your success as well, man. A lot of new stuff going on for you, for sure, I know. So uh, yeah. appreciate that, and thanks for having me, man. Thanks, buddy. And many thanks to DJ Shockley for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. He's a lot of fun. He's got a great story and just glad that he shared it with us here today on the show. You heard about his new podcast, Triple Threat. You can go subscribe to that and then check him out on ESPN and the SEC Network during the college football season. Many thanks to DJ for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. We also want to thank our partners, Ronald Blue Trust. You can check them out at ronblue.com, Blue. Dot com And they have a ton of experience dealing with finances, financial situations, financial planning, questions you might have. They are awesome. Call them, email them, check them out. They will answer any questions that you might have on your finances. Check them out at ronblue.com. You can also go to our website, sportspectrum.com. That's the home base for all of our content here at the Ministry of Sports Spectrum. We got daily devotionals every single morning at 6 a.m. We have articles intersecting the world of sports and faith and Jesus all day long. And then every podcast is there. Can you believe we've been over 500 episodes of this podcast? And every single one of them is right there on the website at sportspectrum.com. Dot com. We also have a couple other places we can direct you to, including our social media pages. Just search Sports Spectrum on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We have a YouTube channel with lots of content, including the podcast. A lot of the video portions of these interviews can be found over at our YouTube channel as well. So check that out and subscribe there, Sports Spectrum. And lastly, whatever app that you're listening to this podcast on, do us a favor and click the subscribe button here as well. That way you never miss an episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast. Thank you again for tuning in. My name is Jason Romano. We are honored that you would listen to today's show. We love you guys and we hope you'll tune in next time right here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. I do hope you all have a great rest of your day.